So I would like to welcome Professor Jonathan Holm um, from ETH Zurich. So we have just had finished one from ETH Zurich now again. Um, so you can understand the kind of physics going on in ETH. So a little bit of background, uh, Jonathan had his um, PhD from Oxford and then um, moved on or actually carried some uh, postdoc also in Oxford, then moved to NIST and then joined ETH. And now he's a full professor since 2019. Of course, he has uh, quite a number of fellowships and rewards. Um, the latest one I see is Golden Owl, uh, which is for his teaching. So I believe you will enjoy it. Good. Okay. Thanks very much for the introduction. Also, thanks very much for the uh, invitation to uh, talk. It would have been nice, of course, to come and visit you guys uh, uh, as part of this, but this is the modern world. So we fortunately, even in times of crisis, can give these talks remotely. Yeah. So as I explained to our host, uh, your subject of one of my experiments today, this is the first time I give a keynote talk through my Mac. So apologize if we have problems, uh, but uh, I'm an experimentalist. I guess that that means that what I know is that experiments always go wrong. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, hopefully this one doesn't because it's been uh, the groundwork is better prepared. Good. So the today's lecture will be on then uh, how to control uh, trap back to trapped ion systems. So these are these charged atoms in uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, traps. In fact, today we'll all be uh, electric traps uh, with both uh, static and ponderomotive fields. So this is what we call RF pull traps. And I think you saw uh, previous introductions to those and particularly from Stefan Village, I saw relevant information for this talk. In fact, the very nature of the trap itself is not a major requirement for this talk. Uh, I will mainly call this uh, uh, trap uh, the, the sort of source of the harmonic oscillator, if you like. And what we want to learn about today is how in trapped ion physics, we manipulate that harmonic oscillator uh, with the aim of making interesting uh, quantum mechanical states. And just to start you off, uh, I've drawn on the front cover, if you like, uh, this picture uh, that you see uh, here. So this is actually a, a quantum state, this picture that you see here. And I've made a map of this quantum state where you can think about the axes uh, of this graph as being somehow uh, position uh, and momentum. And uh, this is a plot, if you like, of the probability to find an ion with a particular value of position and momentum. So in particular, wherever you see red points, there is a, a probability to get a particular position momentum value corresponding to that red point. And the density of the red tells you how high that probability is. But this is a, a Wigner function, actually. And one of the special things about a Wigner function, which we'll learn in this talk, uh, is that it can take negative values. And that's a, a key signature, if you like, of a quantum mechanical state. So states that we can make by a classical ensemble uh, of prob pr producing something with some random variable uh, probabilistically can only take positive values on this sort of uh, phase space, if you like. Uh, and in quantum states, we can take negative values. And that's one key thing that people have been playing with uh, in trapped ion physics is how to make uh, quantum states of the motional uh, oscillator. So um, what is the trapped ion mechanical uh, oscillator? Let me just give you the most basic things about it. Uh, why is it an interesting tool? Because it's extremely well isolated uh, from its environment. Okay, so this is a single charge, an atom, trapped in a vacuum, a ultra high vacuum, by electromagnetic fields. And in our case, there's a combination of a static uh, potential uh, plus some sort of uh, RF uh, potential, which is going to play no role uh, in the rest of this uh, talk. So what do we have with that? We have that the charge is confined at a particular point in space. It seeks the uh, equilibrium point, if you like, but it makes small excursions about that equilibrium. And then in the trapped ion physics, those are extremely well uh, described by a harmonic oscillator potential. So this is the sort of classic harmonic oscillator. We have a spring constant, which is coming uh, from the 
trap, if you like. So maybe I call it spring just to make it clear. But it's very commonly written in this way of just writing the mass times the uh, frequency squared. Just for convenience, it leaves us with fewer parameters to concentrate on. So all the physics that we're going to deal with today uh, deals with this, uh, these atoms cooled into the quantum mechanical regime. And of course, what you know uh, from your undergraduate quantum mechanics is that at that point, uh, we can write the Hamiltonian in terms of these creation and annihilation uh, operators. Uh, and just because we'll use it in future work, I remind you then that the, um, the position uh, given by this excursion from equilibrium is written uh, by uh, basically the zero point motion uh, multiplied by the sum of the creation and annihilation operators that we get. Okay, so that's the sort of, of course, that's really basic physics, right? This is stuff that has maybe nothing to do with uh, trapped ions themselves. Uh, where it becomes relevant to trapped ions is to think about what the relevant frequencies are, uh, what the size of this motion is, uh, and how that compares to other uh, things that we use to control the system. So in the trapped ion case, then the, the motion that we talk about, the harmonic oscillator motion, uh, is between about 1 and 10 megahertz. Uh, and this depends then on the mass of the ion, typically, and on the strength of the potentials. So what you will find, oh, sorry, that should not have happened. So what you will find is that for uh, heavy uh, ions, and uh, many people are using, uh, say, ytterbium, right, which has got um, 171 uh, atomic mass units, you'll find that you have around a one megahertz trap frequency. Uh, and then the lightest ions that we have are, are beryllium, which have about nine atomic mass units. And you will typically find that these are the ions then that have the higher circular frequencies, right? So um, we can calculate from that because what we have here is only the mass of the ion and the frequency of the ion. What is the size of the zero point motion? So that gives you the uh, uh, root mean squared deviation of the ground state wave packet. And typical values you'd see in trapped ion physics are around 10 nanometers, okay? So uh, by contrast with that, oh, sorry, this is more annoying than I thought. Um, by contrast with that, you should think about what could uh, cause this not to be a harmonic oscillator, right? So uh, the thing to always compare with there is some sort of uh, measure of anharmonicity. And uh, there we should think about a length scale that defines the anharmonicity. So you've just been hearing about neutral atoms, right? Neutral atoms indeed, in, in Tillman's situation there, trapped in light fields, right? And the length scale is set by the wavelength of the light. And that means that these are relatively unharmonic because wavelengths of light are a few hundred nanometers and the zero point motion in a, even in a 10 megahertz trap, which is hard for them to achieve, uh, would be 10 nanometers, right? So a factor of 10 or so below. But in an ion trap, the relevant scale is somehow given by the size of the trap and the very smallest traps that people are using uh, are of order uh, 10 microns or so. I would say more like 50 microns. Let's call it 100 just for the sake of argument. Okay. And you can see that that 100 microns is much, much smaller than the 10 nanometers. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that uh, ion traps are extremely harmonic traps. So this description of having a harmonic oscillator in a trap holds even when you've got quite a highly excited oscillator, which would have many more, well, many multiples, if you like, of 10 nanometers, it's still going to be much less than 100 microns. So these are very harmonic uh, traps indeed. So uh, what is the interest then in the emotional states of trapped ions and what can we do with them? Uh, in a certain sense, this was the entry point for all the quantum control that you've heard about uh, for trapped ions uh, in the uh, probably in the preceding lectures. A lot of what's happened in terms of uh, progress in quantum computing, progress in quantum simulations, even progress now in spectroscopy, like the quantum logic spectroscopy you saw Stefan talking about, uh, stems from the ability, if you like, to cool the motion of these ions down towards the ground state. Yeah. And that those pioneering steps, if you like, started with Doppler cooling of ions in the 1970s, uh, 
uh, and were really brought into the ground state by uh, Wineland and co-workers and also people uh, in uh, related groups at the time in Germany, uh, which were able to cool into the quantum ground state. And that was sort of the starting point for uh, a lot of the physics I'll tell you about today. So what do people then do with these uh, mechanical oscillator systems? Uh, I think the first uh, place and the thing you'll see most of today is that these are somehow a test bed for quantum control. Can you, uh, starting from a pure quantum state, that's the ground state of motion, can you create different quantum states? Can you explore what those quantum states uh, are able to do? Uh, and indeed, as you explore this, can you find ways in which that can be propagated into other systems? Um, a second feature, which is important, but a little less important in this talk, uh, is going to be that the Coulomb interaction is what couples uh, ions together. And the Coulomb interaction, if you think about two ions close to each other, I hope you can see me here. Uh, so the, the Coulomb interaction essentially uh, means that one ion pushes on the other, but if one ion moves, then of course it creates a different force acting on the other one, right? So the coupling, this Coulomb interaction depends on the position of the ion. And of course the position is an intrinsic feature of this oscillatory motion. So all the quantum gates uh, that you will see, uh, say Christian Roos talk about, uh, these rely on the fact that you've got these coupled uh, oscillators. So another feature of sort of the general exploration of quantum mechanics, uh, and that's something that you will see in today's talk, if you like, is that as opposed to two state systems inside an atom, which are related to where um, an electron sits with respect to the nucleus, uh, an oscillator, the oscillation of this particle can go to larger and larger amplitudes. And in a certain sense, that means it's a system where, okay, when you have this system in the quantum ground state, you've got 10 nanometer size wave functions, but uh, in principle, one could make bigger and bigger quantum states such that you start to have wave functions that are spanning over uh, microns or more and, and starting to come up towards the classical regime. So that's to say that oscillators as opposed to spins are systems that you find both in classical physics and in quantum physics. And so in that sense, then, this is a, an interesting system to explore if you're trying to examine this crossover from classical behavior to quantum behavior. So then um, some of the things that are both good and bad, right? One is that they're sensitive to their environment, right? So why is that? We've got here a, a light charge, right? Single atom. So light, uh, because it's a single uh, atom, right? And that means if you have electric fields, that's going to move this atom quite considerably, right? What that means is it's sensitive. And if you can cool down to the ground state, that's sort of uh, getting towards the ultimate sensitivity. Uh, it's sensitive to uh, electric fields. And that can be a good thing if you want to sense electric fields. It can also be a bad thing because uh, maybe your iron trap itself produces noisy electric fields and then you have to deal with those, right? So sensing has been another area where um, uh, the motional states of trapped ions have been used. And then finally, uh, and I think you maybe saw this in Stefan's talk, uh, the ions are sensitive. In fact, indeed, they're sensitive to uh, other effects, right? They're sensitive to other light particles which scatter from them. And one of them that's being used in spectroscopy today is the fact that if you have a neighboring ion uh, which uh, scatters a photon, there's a recoil kick from that. And a single photon can produce a considerable kick on the, uh, on the pair of ions, if you like, which can then be detected. So there you start to be able to see that uh, in spectroscopy of some species that you'd like to get hold of, you only really have to scatter one or a few photons before you can detect that there was, a that there was some scattering going on. And so then you can compare in this species of interest was the scattering, was the no scattering? And that's basically the tools of spectroscopy. Okay, so these are sort of the motivating uh, reasons as I see them for studying the motional states of trapped ions. Uh, now what I want to do is to show you the different tools that we use uh, in general uh, to study this. So the basically all the physics that I'm going to tell you about is encompassed by something uh, looking, well, not really looking like this. This is my cartoon, of course, but uh, what we have here is a, a trapped atom, right? Sitting somewhere between some gold uh, electrodes. And there's a laser 
uh, and I'm going to stick to just laser fields, uh, which is then uh, controlling the motion of that trapped atom. So we can think about what a laser field is, right? It's essentially got a, a, an electric field and uh, it's got uh, an electric field strength and it's got a certain oscillation frequency, which I'll call uh, omega L, right? It's got some sort of frequency. Right? But uh, then we can think, what does it uh, couple to about the atom, right? Uh, the electric field, in fact, mainly couples to the uh, internal, either dipole or quadrupole moment of the atom, right? Uh, so that's not the aspect necessarily that couples to the uh, motion of the atom. But the key thing about a laser field is it also uh, conveys momentum. Photons carry momentum, right? And it's this momentum transfer coupled with the fact that we couple to internal states of the atoms that's going to be key uh, to trapped ion control. So what we have there uh, is then these, this motion, right? And there are, I just noticed, but we're going to ignore it throughout the rest of the talk, that there are three oscillators per ion. And why is that? Because we live in a 3D uh, world. And so there are three uh, directions of motion. But all of these are described by a harmonic oscillator and all the motional directions have different frequencies. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say, okay, the frequencies we choose will only look at one particular uh, oscillator, okay? On top of that, we have internal states of the ion, and I've drawn these as a spin, uh, but this will not necessarily be a spin, right? So not necessary uh, to have a spin. It could be uh, an optical transition. And in fact, I will focus uh, uh, always on optical transitions uh, in the talk that we have today, right? So uh, on top of that, then we have this laser-induced coupling, and we can give it a certain strength, omega. Uh, and it's the thing that's going to couple these two together because it couples both to the uh, dipole or quadrupole moments of the uh, internal states, but also the momentum allows it to couple to the uh, oscillator states, right? So here's the momentum. And if you like, here's the uh, quadrupole or dipole moments, right? So internal structure. So if we're to scan the frequency of the laser, that's what you see plotted here, across a resonance of a two level system in a trapped ion system, then you'll see that there's this strong resonance at the frequency. So that's what I've called omega naught here. I should maybe just label this as omega naught. And then in addition to that, I see resonant behaviors or some sort of resonant excitation that seems to happen at other frequencies here. Uh, and these are the frequencies of the motion. So if you like, the frequencies that we find are omega zero plus omega z, omega zero plus some omega y, and omega zero plus uh, omega x. These three being the different types of motion from the three dimensions of the ion, okay? And we also see resonances exactly at the counterparts, which sit at omega zero minus uh, omega z, uh, et cetera, if you like. Uh, they sit at lower frequencies by emotional frequency than the central frequency. So what are these? These are modulation sidebands. It's like when you have a radio, right? You take a carrier signal at a certain frequency, and then you either amplitude modulate it, or in this particular case, you're phase modulating the radio. And what's happening here is that as the ion oscillates, you can think of the Doppler shift of the laser that's incident on it. Uh, the ion oscillates backwards and forwards, and it basically phase modulates the laser as seen in the ion rest frame. So let's write down some Hamiltonians. I, I think you've seen some of this stuff from uh, Didi Leibfried uh, earlier, a few days ago, right? Uh, the Hamiltonian that describes the ion interaction, if you like, here's our Rabi frequency again, producing uh, proportional to the field. Uh, here's our creation operator on the internal states. We've got here uh, the laser frequency. And uh, a critical aspect here is that we've got uh, this term here where I'm already de dealing in uh, one dimension and X is the uh, position of the iron. Okay, so uh, under certain conditions, then I can start to expand out uh, this exponential. And in addition to that, and I know you did this with Didi, you can go into an interaction picture with respect to the motion of the iron, 
And what that really means is that you take, uh, pra in practice, it's as simple as saying, uh, if I go into an interaction picture with a Hamiltonian of an oscillator, uh, oscillating with frequency uh, omega, which you see here, it means replacing the A operators by A e to the minus I omega t, uh, and replacing the A daggers by an e to the plus I omega t. So if we expand out this exponential, what we see is that there's a term with no time dependence, but then there are these additional terms which have uh, a destruction and a creation operator in and have some additional uh, time dependence in them. So I can think about putting that expansion back into this Hamiltonian. And one of the things that I have to do there is I have to say, how far should I go in my expansion, right? How, what's the higher order terms here? Uh, and what we say and what we typical regime we work in is when this parameter eta, which is basically k uh, times uh, the uh, x naught, the zero point uh, RMS motion of the uh, oscillator, right? When that's much, much less than one, or at least when eta squared is much, much less than one, then uh, we say that we can truncate this expansion uh, and get rid of the higher order terms, yeah? Uh, and there's two ways of looking at this eta parameter. One is that it compares the uh, RMS wave function uh, stent to the um, wavelength of light, right? So it's a ratio of those two. The other one is that the recoil energy of photons that are emitted from the, or of the atom when it emits a photon at a given wavelength compared to the energy of a quanta of the motion. And in our case, and I'm just gonna use numbers from calcium here, uh, we have here X naught of around 10 nanometers. We have a wavelength of around 700 nanometers. And you see that when you square the ratio of those two, indeed you'll be in a situation where this is much less than one and we can justify our approximation. So what should we expect to see? We see again, these modulation uh, sidebands. Uh, and now depending on which resonance we're picking out, we get different Hamiltonians. So if we just drive at the direct spin flip frequency, this is this peak uh, in the center here, we see that we've got uh, just a, a term which acts on the internal state of the atom. If we instead tune to this lower modulation sideband, then the resonant term now is one that's reduced in strength by this factor eta, which is much less than one, remember, but has interesting terms in the sense that when you excite the spin, then you have to destroy a quanta of the motion. And so that's drawn in this diagram uh, up here. Uh, here we have um, a situation, right? Where if I started in the n equal to one um, motional state, so these are the motional states along the bottom, these are the spin states along the side, then in exciting the atom to the excited state, I have to lose a quanta of motion, right? And so this is driving on this uh, red sideband, and that's why I drive with these diagonal red arrows. And the other situation which is very common is that we tune uh, to the other side, to this other resonance, right? And there you see again, it's weaker by this factor eta, but here now when you create quanta in the internal states, you also create them in the motional states. So in a sense, that's this other transition which goes direct diagonally uh, up from uh, down to up. Okay, so as I say, this is phase modulation essentially of the laser that produces these sidebands. And by picking the frequency of the laser, we can pick out different Hamiltonians. And this allows us then to manipulate the motion of the ion because some of these Hamiltonians uh, have motional operators in them. So you've already seen from Didi, if you like, how that's used to produce uh, laser cooling. So there we drive this uh, red sideband so remember it destroys quanta if we excite the spin uh, and we add to that a dissipation channel, which means that the spin can uh, decay. Um, what does that do? So a Hamiltonian is always a bi-directional process. It's unitary, right? So it's completely reversible and it'll produce some sort of cyclic uh, dynamics in this two state system. But when we have the dissipation, what that does is it's uh, single directional. It, uh, the spin decays from up to down, but it doesn't decay from down to up. And in our atoms, if you like, uh, we uh, implement that by implementing the Hamiltonians on this transition here at 729 nanometers, uh, but then quenching this transition with an excitation at 854 nanometers to these states here, which are short-lived states. And from there, it decays down into the ground state. 
But the atom never gets excited from the ground state up to the P3 halves and drops into the other state. So this is the thing that breaks the symmetry, if you like, and tells us that we will pump in one direction. Now, what happens then if we uh, do this uh, cooling, right? So this is the bit of the sequence uh, that I've drawn here, is that there's some cooling. And then we probe again on this same sideband, okay? So we uh, come after the cooling and we then try and probe this sideband again. And what we'll see is that if we've uh, cooled, we should expect population to arrive down in the ground state here. But in the ground state, there's no possibility to excite the uh, spin again, right? I can put a nice cross on that because it's got nowhere to go. You can't remove any more motion. And that's what you see here. The, the plot along the, the bottom here is the time that the cooling is applied for. And you see the ability to excite the sideband. I excite from, if I didn't excite, I would be at one, if you like, and, and this goes down, uh, is reduced as I go on with the sideband cooling and it comes to a steady state where basically I can't excite this sideband anymore, yeah? Now, how would we draw that if we were to look in phase space? Again, we've got this momentum uh, and position phase space, and you would see that this is an uh, oscillator, which if it's really at zero energy, should sit at zero amplitude in both position and momentum, right? But you have zero point motion, and that's the width of this blob that you see here uh, is the uh, ground state uncertainty. Okay, so that's basically sideband cooling. And just to say something about these phase space pictures that's just important in terms of understanding things. So um, I'm going to plot this uh, Wigner function, right? Uh, and I call it a quasi probability distribution because of the fact it can be negative, right? And you can see that from the following, and maybe I can give you an argument why the negativity is important. One of the important things about this Wigner distribution is that I can get the probability density in position by integrating over the momentum of the Wigner function. But if you think about it, there are wave functions and you know about them, the Fox states, right? Which have, ah, sorry, that shouldn't have happened. Um, there are wave functions, right? Which have zeros in their probability distribution, right? So these are where you have nodes uh, of the wave function. And what does that mean? That means that that zero, right, has got to be given by an integral over all the momentum uh, values, right? So wherever we have nodes of a wave function, we should expect that we have both positive uh, and negative uh, values. Otherwise, the whole thing is trivial and should be zero over that whole uh, span, right? So what this means is that if uh, you see, oh, at least, one of the things is that any wave functions that would produce nodes, yeah, should be ones that uh, would have negative values coming from the Wigner function, right? And uh, wave functions with nodes are things that happen for Fox states and happen for higher order states, but they don't just happen for uh, the ground state. It has no nodes, right? And they don't happen if you displace the ground state and things like that. You have to do something special. And usually you have to couple to some sort of quantum degree of freedom in our case, that's going to be the spin. Yeah. So another final comment to make uh, about these Wigner functions, and here I do just plot a Gaussian distribution, is that if you went and just looked at position uh, and momentum of our uh, Wigner functions, you would find typically that anything displaced from the origin would be rotating uh, around the center uh, with an angular frequency omega. Okay, that's the trap frequency. That is that when you have an oscillator that's in an extreme of position, uh, it then oscillate or it then gets accelerated towards the origin, at which point it has high momentum, but no position uh, and keeps on sloshing backwards and forwards. So we always work in essentially the interaction picture. Yeah. Uh, and in the interaction picture, I here called it the rotating frame, if you like, uh, then any oscillator that's just stably at what or is stable, uh, it will be just at one position in space, if you like, and it'll stay there. So the basic notion here is that the coordinates that we use uh, are also oscillating round and round in exactly the same as the uh, phase space picture we had before. Yeah. So we track the trivial evolution. The trivial evolution is just the oscillation of the ion in the trap. Okay, um, 
the units on this graph, that's the other thing to say, is just uh, what's the distance, if you like, in, in the real space, uh, so in nanometers, for instance, uh, divided by the units of the zero point motion, right? So here I have the zero point motion of seven nanometers. Uh, and so this distance in the space space is somehow related to uh, real space by this, this, this notion here. Okay, so what do we do when we have motional states? Well, one of the typical things we do is we try and learn about them, right? And in fact, that's one of the interesting areas of dealing with oscillators. They've got higher Hilbert spaces. And so you have to think a little bit hard and you have some freedom to think, uh, how would you like to measure them? So one of the classic measurements that's made is actually to use the anti Janes Cummings Hamiltonian. So that's this other Hamiltonian, which has this sigma plus uh, and the, I've drawn this wrong, I realize. So there should be a dagger here. There should be no dagger there, okay? So this is the sort of energy non-conserving one where the spin gets excited and, and so does the oscillator. And the key thing about that is that the matrix elements, as you change the value of N here, the matrix elements of this Hamiltonian, they increase as square root of N, right? So what does that mean? That means if you start with an atom uh, in the ground state, what you should see is just uh, that it gets driven between two states, right? and it'll have a certain Rabi frequency. There will be an oscillation that you see. So uh, indeed, this is what you see here. But actually, if you look carefully, uh, what you'll see uh, is that the oscillations don't quite go uh, to the same depth every time they oscillate, right? And that's uh, an indication that we weren't purely in the ground state. There's a little bit of population indicating that we have some other frequency component uh, in these oscillations. And that's that actually in this case, there's a small probability that the iron didn't start in the ground state, but it started in the n equal one state where it oscillates a little bit faster. And so that's what we do. We can look at the Fourier components of such a Rabi oscillation. And uh, we see the different weights of the different components. And that tells us what's our population of the different states. And so in this case, we would deduce we had a 97% ground state occupation. Uh, in, in this particular case. Yeah, this is data from years ago. So that's got one frequency component, okay, or roughly one frequency component. As I said, there's a slight other frequency component producing our uh, imperfection, if you like. But uh, there's no reason to stop uh, at that point and just make ground states, right? So now that we have uh, these different transitions, uh, one, the carrier, that's this one, which just has a sigma plus uh, plus a sigma minus. Uh, we have the blue sideband that also acts on the motion. Then uh, if we choose the lengths of these different pulses, then sequences of these can actually be made to achieve arbitrary superpositions of the motional states. And just to give you an idea, one that's very commonly used is you start from the ground state and you make a, a pi by two transfer uh, to go to the excited state, right? So I could draw a little bit of different population here. That would be a carrier transition and then make a pi pulse. Uh, so this would be a pi on the uh, blue sideband, or actually the red sideband in this case. Sorry, I should just uh, correct myself, right? This would be this red sideband, the Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian. And that thing there produces a superposition of the zero uh, and the one state, right? And then we can diagnose it. We just drive the blue sideband and again, look for the Fourier components, right? That's very common. But more arbitrary solutions can, uh, or more complicated pulse sequences can produce arbitrary superpositions of states. Uh, one example that I just wanted to show, this is data from the original uh, paper on this from Dave Weinland's group, where actually they've made a superposition of the zero and three Fox states. So uh, zero, this should uh, flop at uh, root one, if you like, this is the square root of n dependence. Uh, and this one here should be at the square root of uh, four. So you should see two components, one of which oscillates twice as fast as the other. And indeed, that integer relationship is why at some point they completely invert the spin uh, a little later uh, on. Yeah. So this was the first demonstration of this. More recently, uh, NIST have made actually use these techniques to make Fox states going all the way up to n equal to 100 uh, and going superpositions all the way up to uh, 0 plus 18 if you like, right? So they push the control. And this makes you then very sensitive to uh, trap frequency fluctuations. So it's something that's useful for sensing uh, in terms of if you get faster averaging down of data, if you can make a bigger 
motional superposition and zero plus 18 is, is certainly a large, what we would call a large motional superposition. Uh, Jonathan, uh, would you mind to take questions now or at the end? Oh, no, we can do it now. That would be good. Yeah. Um, so there is basically two questions. One is about the about the Wigner quasi probability. Mm -hmm. Can it take values greater than one, or like normal probability, it should be less than one? Yeah, it can't take values up to one. In fact, the largest value it can take uh, is two divided by pi. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that's all I can really say. I think uh, I would have to look at the maths as to precisely why that is, but that's what I remember is that the maximum value is two over pi. Okay, good. I think that's that's all for the time being. So I think we can move on. Great. Yeah. Uh, one new message, I see. No, oh, there's this. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so I've just told you about lasers, and I sort of indicated earlier on that the only thing you can do is is using lasers, but it's not, right? You can also use the electric potentials of the trap uh, to, to also generate uh, quantum states. And I think it's worth mentioning because actually it's significantly sort of easier not to have to bother with a laser, uh, but also that these states somehow are, are um, useful states in the context of uh, a lot of quantum control tests. So the basic notion is that you can apply on one of the voltages of your trap some uh, oscillating voltage, right? And at the position of the ion, that's likely to produce an electric field, right? So you can imagine, that's what we call it a tickle very often. Uh, you can imagine a Hamiltonian term that's got this electric field. Uh, it's an energy, so it's proportional to position and it oscillates at this cosine omega t. Yeah. So um, again, we go into the interaction picture of this uh, X operator, right? We make it uh, look at the oscillating components, but we can tune this electric field resonant with the oscillation, at which point the remaining Hamiltonian is something which uh, looks like this, right? It's just a, a constant term in product with the position essentially of the uh, atom. So if we uh, turn that into a unitary transformation, we apply it for a certain amount of time. We find that we're exponentiating something which has got A and A dagger terms in it. And that then uh, it corresponds to what we would call a displacement operator. So what does that do? If you start from an atom in a ground state and apply this displacement, uh, it's like displacing the center of your trap. What you do is you end up with what we would call uh, a coherent state, uh, which is a, basically the ground state probability distribution or wave function displaced to some position in the phase space. So uh, here is a picture, if you like, you might have started at the origin of phase space uh, and now what you have is you've displaced by some distance, which uh, in this case would be some IE uh, electric field times T uh, over two, if you like, if you displaced in position. In fact, what I can see from this is that this is not a displacement in position, but uh, if I was treating this as both, uh, if this is momentum, uh, this is position, uh, then we would see that we've displaced diagonally. So uh, the Hamiltonian there, the basic difference in this case here would be that I should add some additional uh, phase component here, okay? So I can choose the phase of my electric field versus the oscillation uh, phase of my atom, if you like, and that will choose the direction that I make a displacement in this phase space. So then I can apply the same analysis, right? The analysis there was to drive the blue sideband uh, and look what the Rabi oscillations do. And what you see now is that there are many more frequency components present. So if I was to do the Fourier transform of this, you'd have to, you'd find a lot of frequency components. And that produces this classic uh, collapse and revival uh, um, behavior, which people knew well, if you like, from the poor people uh, always looked for in cavity QED, uh, which is to say that the, um, the key to it is that the uh, coherent state has a, a Poisson distribution of the different Fox states that are involved, yeah? What does that mean? It means it's got a, a Poisson sampling, if you like, uh, of the different Rabi frequencies that are involved in creating this uh, spin evolution, right? So what happens to them? Because there's a distribution of a certain width, after a certain amount of time, all of the different uh, Rabi frequencies get out of phase with each other, and we get this collapse in the spin population, right? All the different frequency components are not in phase, you stop getting oscillations. But at some point later, uh, when two neighboring components come into uh, sync with each other, 
then what you'll find is that because this is a fairly, uh, the distribution here, the width of this distribution is not so wide, yeah, then roughly speaking, all of these come back into phase with each other at the same time, and that produces this uh, revival. And it's not to one, and the reason it's not to one, because not all of them come into phase at exactly the right same time, yeah. So this interesting, this uh, Rabi oscillations, if you like, are indicative of uh, a particular distribution. And it's this is sort of a well-known behavior for this Poisson type distribution you get from a coherent state. You can also um, think about making the trap, uh, modulating the trap such as to produce squeeze states. So um, uh, let me just say how that's done and then I'll tell you something about the squeeze states if you like. Here, instead of modulating an electric field, uh, you moderate, modulate a quadratic term in your Hamiltonian, right? So same sort of game, there's some sort of cos of omega s times t, but now it's an x squared term that we see here. And now, um, if you choose the modulation frequency to be twice the trap frequency, then again, into the interaction picture, look for resonant Hamiltonians, you'll find uh, that these uh, Hamiltonians are things with A squared terms or A dagger squared terms, the resonant terms are. And so what does that mean? If we exponentiate such a Hamiltonian, then what we find is an operator here, which is an operator which has got uh, an exponential with A squareds and A dagger squareds sitting in the exponential. And what we know about that is that if we apply that to a ground state ion, it generates squeeze states of that uh, ion. So what's a squeeze state? So here's a Wigner function again of one of these uh, squeeze states. And the key thing about it, if you like, is that the width here uh, is, uh, let me call it delta uh, x, I call it delta x squared to be a variance, is given by, if you like, the, um, the variance of the ground state, but suppressed by a factor which is e to the minus two r, where essentially r uh, is equal to the magnitude of this eta uh, t uh, over four. So it's the argument of this uh, operator up here, right? So what we find is that um, by applying the squeezing, right, we can reduce the width of the uncertainty in position uh, by a factor which is e to the minus two r relative to the width that we'd expect to get for the ground state uh, wave function. And the cost we pay because we have to uh, satisfy Heisenberg is that this quadrature here, which would be like would be a delta P squared, uh, would be uh, then some sort of P naught squared uh, over four times an E to the two R. It has to get larger, right? Uh, and so these two things come together, but uh, one of the nice features is that you can reduce the uncertainty, say, in position. And that's good if you wanted to, if you had a signal say coming from an electric field, which would change the position of the iron, then uh, you're more sensitive to that now because you've got smaller quantum fluctuations of the iron in that direction. And that was sort of motivating, uh, if you like, the guys at NIST to pursue this uh, method. So one thing that you see of this um, squeezing uh, operator is that it's got uh, a squared terms and it's got a dagger squared terms in it, right? So starting from a ground state, which has no quanta, uh, it's going to produce pairs of quanta, right? So a characteristic thing in this uh, Fox state distribution that you see here, this should be N sitting here, is that it only contains the even terms uh, or even Fox states, right? So that's a key thing about squeeze states. And um, what these guys at NIST were able to do, sorry, uh, I should just go back. Uh, was actually to achieve a 20 dB uh, reduction in the quadrature variance. So that's a factor of 100 in variance. Yeah, that's quite impressive. And they were actually able to do sensing them with a 7 dB gain in their sensitivity due to the fact that they'd used squeeze states. So these are two electronic methods. The one very nice thing about these electronic methods is they allow you to make uh, these Gaussian states so one of the keys about a squeeze state is that there's no negative Wigner function here. It's not got that sort of special quantum uh, property, if you like, though they're very useful states for sensing and things, yeah? So what you see is that the electric fields or the electric modulation of the trap potential allow you to um, make states which are Gaussian, right? But have interesting features and high sensitivity, for instance, in this case, because of the squeezing. 
So let's go back to the laser control. I want to show you another way in which one can generate uh, squeezed states. Uh, so this technique is based on what I would call uh, reservoir engineering. So it was actually proposed way back in the 1990s. Uh, and then we were lucky enough that it was still lying open to be done uh, in the 2000s, if you like, when I started my research group. And the reservoir engineering in this context, at least, uh, uh, is actually remarkably similar to ground state cooling. So I'm actually showing here exactly the same plot that you saw previously for the ground state cooling, right? It has a combination of this red sideband that in exciting the spin removes a quanta uh, and uh, some dissipation which relaxes the spin. Except that what we did in this experiment was to apply that exact same physics, but in a basis where all of the states here are not anymore the energy eigenstates, but are squeezed uh, energy eigenstates. So you take the Fox state and you apply the squeezing operator to it. So what's, uh, why did we do that? Well, because the interesting thing about that is if you ground state cool in that basis, then your ground state turns out not to be the energy ground state, but it turns out to be a squeeze state of motion. Yeah, the one we've just seen uh, previously. So how does that work? Well, you want to find a Hamiltonian that looks like the uh, red sideband, right? And so here is such a Hamiltonian, except that this should be an annihilation operator. in the squeezed basis, right? So op in the uh, squeezed uh, basis. So how do we uh, construct that? Well, one thing we can do is we can just have a look if we can construct it from the original annihilation operator. And so actually what we can do there is you, if you apply the squeezing operator to the annihilation operator, you'll find that you get a sum of a destruction operator with some weight uh, new and another term which has got a creation operator with some rate uh, new, yeah? And what that is actually doing is this is actually the operator which now uh, destroys quanta in this squeezed uh, basis. And what's the key now in terms of a laboratory implementation? What do we need to do? We need to make terms which look like an A times sigma plus and also an A dagger times a sigma plus. And so those are two terms that we know already. I've told you about already, if you like. One A sigma plus comes from driving a red sideband. So we have to drive the red sideband with some weight. And an A dagger times sigma plus comes from driving a blue sideband, right? But now we have to drive them together, do the spin excitation together. And we have to make sure there's a free, uh, good phase relationship between the two. And so what we do there is we apply a two frequency laser field. We drive both this transition and this transition simultaneously. And then all of the physics that we did for uh, single Fox states in terms of ground state cooling just gets converted to the same physics, but in now this squeezed uh, basis. So uh, here is the same graph I showed you for ground state cooling, except now what we're probing here is uh, the squeezed sideband in a certain sense, right? Uh, what we see is the cooling part we, we probe, probe on the exact same Hamiltonian. We get the same physics where we can't drive out of here because we arrived in the ground state. But in this case, it's a squeeze state of motion. So now we can also think about our analysis techniques, right? So this is the analysis we performed uh, before. This is, these are the energy eigenstates. Here's the square root of N uh, dependence. And now if we analyze our squeeze state, just with a single sideband drive, we see again some mix of frequency components. And if we look at that distribution in N, we see again, same thing we saw for the NIST experiment, that there are only even occupied states, right? And that's because we've pumped into a, a squeeze state. But uh, we can also do the same thing I just did, but we play the same trick uh, working on the blue sideband, right? So we, uh, engineer here, if you like, something that looks like K plus times sigma plus, plus our K times our sigma minus, but now all in this squeezed basis. So here would be U would be the case of the squeezed basis. In that case, if I've started in the squeeze state, that's my ground state of motion, I should expect to see only one frequency component, exactly as being in the ground state of uh, motion when I did normal sideband cooling. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw, okay, it decays, right? but we saw basically a single frequency component there when we probed in the correct uh, basis, right? 
And so looking at the population distribution in the squeezed basis then, then what you see is that we have a high population in the ground state and we have a small contribution from other frequency components. And this immediately layer allows us to tell you what the fidelity which, with which we can create the squeeze state was. Okay, so um, one thing you'll see from that, you'll see in almost every experimental diagram is that uh, the, it's not perfect, right? And one thing that's not perfect is that you can see this decay uh, envelope that's happening to this quantum state, right? So what is it in trapped ion physics that limits the control of motional states? So the, there are two things. One we would call motional uh, heating, and it's coming from exactly the same sort of physics that we saw before, right? We have an electric field, which now is not us trying to modulate some voltage on an electrode, but is some noise, right? And I'll come to the sources of noise in a moment. So what's that doing? It's this Hamiltonian that uh, is proportional to position, right? It's shifting noisily around the center of the potential well. And so if it's got a short correlation time, you can go and have a look at a Fermi golden rule type treatment, right? Uh, and you find that this here is what we would say is the heating uh, from uh, n equal to zero, I should say zero to uh, the one state, right? Uh, and it's given by some factors. So you'll find that uh, the, the mass is appearing here. It's harder to heat a heavy mass ion, if you like, the trap frequency, because this is telling us uh, how quickly we go in terms of numbers of quanta, right? So the trap frequency also limits that. If you had infinite frequency, you'd have to have a lot of energy to make a jump in number of quanta. But the key component here is actually that there's an electric field spectral density uh, evaluated at the trap frequency, right? So you see that it's producing a value omega. So it's essentially asking how much of this noisy field turns up being resonant with the ion, and that will cause the heating. So um, what are the sources of that? Well, the first one uh, most common is that you have technical noise, okay? Uh, but if you're working hard, then you should be able to suppress this to what we would say are negligible uh, levels, right? And that's one of the games in a new setup is somehow to you start with a certain level of noise and very often you have to end up going hunting your noise sources to get them down. Um, another source is that we have resistors around these traps. So Johnson noise can play a role, right? Um, but what we find if you look at the numbers for that is that it's much, much too small to explain any of the heating that people see of trapped ions in, in ion traps, yeah. So, um, the third candidate is sort of one of the big unknowns in trapped ion physics, okay? That's what we would call surface noise, yeah? We think it's some sort of fluctuation charge or sort of dipoles on the surfaces of the electrodes. These are normally gold surfaces, but if you look at a surface carefully, you'll find quite often it's not gold at all. It's, it's got hydrocarbons and things on the top of them. So why do we think these come from the surface? Well, we have evidence that surface treatments can improve these things. Uh, we have evidence that cooling down the chips can uh, improve this situation. So we think it's some sort of thermally activated process on the surfaces, but it's one of the things that we really don't understand today. And that's sort of in line with surface physics generally. Surface physics is quite uh, messy and challenging, and, and I think that's affecting us there. So the one way to get over this is to build a trap where the uh, electrodes are very far from the iron. Yeah, And so that's fine, but actually in the long term, Many people would like to make smaller traps for various reasons, getting stronger fields and things like that. So surface noise is one of the big challenges uh, out there in the field uh, today. So this is one source of noise, is motional heating. Uh, the other one that I uh, am duty bound to tell you about, it actually limited the uh, experiments on squeezing that I showed was uh, dephasing, right? So this comes not from uh, the position of the potential well fluctuating in time, but becoming from the curvature fluctuating in time. <clears throat> so if that happens at high frequencies, that can actually parametrically heat the ion, just like the squeezing you saw from the NIST experiment. You can have some sort of squeezing of the ion going on, which excites it up uh, if you have some frequency components at 2 omega. But actually, that's usually completely insignificant in ion trap work. So the more problematic thing is that there is noise, uh, very often technical noise, which uh, affects the frequency of the ion at lower frequencies. And you should think there that the whole bandwidth of frequencies all, all the way up 
now affects whether you can track the phase of the ion because the phase of an oscillator uh, is given by the integral of its uh, frequency all the way from uh, zero up to time t, right? So what that encompasses is any fluctuation of a very large bandwidth uh, that might have happened to the frequency. And that means you lose uh, the sense of the phase of your oscillator. And since I'm writing in these rotating frames, right, this um, rotating Wigner functions, if the phase is shifting, then you can imagine that this uh, rotating picture is wobbling backwards and forwards in an uncontrolled way. Uh, and so that's going to cause me to lose many of the features that I'd like to draw uh, in these quasi-probability distributions. So I should just say the scaling is such that this effect actually dominates and limits many experiments with large oscillator states, but both dephasing and heating are key causes of uh, problems in the, in the lab. Jonathan, there are two questions. Good. If you would that's like exactly to... what I wanted to have a question, so that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you modulate track frequency with x square term? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, let me uh, maybe draw it here. Okay. Um, so imagine you have a trap. It's got three electrodes. Uh, just for the sake of argument, we'll draw three electrodes. Uh, and you, what defines the curvature of this trap? What defines the potential well? Well, it's somehow that there's a, a voltage on this one. I might produce this one at ground, and there's the same voltage on this one, right? Then halfway between these electrodes, you should find a minimum. And so in order to make sure you modulate the second order term, then you have to modulate uh, both of these ones symmetrically about the ion trap position, yeah? And that will produce an X squared term that gets modulated, yeah. Okay, then the other question is, are there regimes where you have to consider more than the spectral density, higher order sort of noise terms? Uh, for the heating, then uh, I don't know of any. That's not to say there aren't regimes, but the, um, essentially the ion is a sort of uh, high Q oscillator. It's got a pretty stable oscillation frequency. And at that point, then it's really the spectral density of the noise, which is uh, um, the, the governing property, if you like, at that frequency. Yeah. Right. So then there is a question which um, I don't know. Is it, does it depend on the strength of BSB and RSB in order to prepare the squeeze state? Yeah, let me go back to that. Uh, so uh, in this uh, picture here, what you'll see is that the, so the thing that defines uh, the squeezing, if you like, uh, I wish I could get rid of all of these things. The squeezing uh, is defined now, right, by, um, by this operator here, which produces me a sum of two terms. And actually the amount of squeezing is given by the ratio of the strengths of these two terms. So what happens in this case is that the ratio of the strength of the red and blue sideband determines how much squeezing you have, but actually the absolute strength of them doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, so it's fairly robust in the sense you can have fluctuations in your laser power, uh, but as long as the ratio of these red and blue sidebands stays the same, then you're still good. Yeah. Okay, then the last one is in case of unresolved sideband, is it possible to cool down? Uh, it's possible to cool down. Uh, you've seen a little bit about that in uh, DD Livery's talk when he talks about EIT cooling. So what you do need in order to cool is you need a heavier weight of driving transitions on some resonance that reduces quanta versus anything that increases quanta. So there are ways of uh, making sure you don't get any excitations on a blue sideband mm -hmm. in EIT cooling, putting a, a zero of your uh, internal state structure on top of it. Um, but typically what will happen is that you, if you don't perfectly eliminate these off resonant processes, then you will you will cool down for sure, but you won't get as cold as you uh, would. You won't get to the ground state, for instance. So one situation you know that Doppler cooling works. You've seen that in an earlier lecture, if you like. That's the unresolved limit of of cooling typically, uh, and to make it easy to go to low temperatures near the ground state, uh, it's typically the case that you want to go into this resolved sideband limit. Okay, I think that's all for the moment. Okay, great. How far through are we, by the way? I feel like I'm slower than I expected. That's all I was like. uh, No, you still have half an hour. Yeah, so I'm going slower than I expected. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Good. Okay. So I'll write less probably. And uh, yes, anyway, let's see. Good. So um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was actually a different type of control, um, which comes from what we call state dependent forces. And it's most commonly been used to make what we call Schrodinger cat states. So these Schrodinger cat states, well, you know about uh, um, cats, right? So you have an alive cat. Uh, it's in a box with an atom that can decay randomly. Uh, and uh, what happens is that that box should release a vial of poison and you get then a dead cat. But if you, if you didn't open the box and you didn't have any information about what's inside the box, you end up in a situation where you've got correlations between whether the atom decayed and whether the cat is alive. And uh, what that means is that you should strictly be writing down a superposition of an atom in an excited state and a cat being alive and an atom in a ground state and the cat being dead. Okay, so there's an entangled state between the uh, spin, which is a microscopic system, and the cat, which is surely, we agree it's a microscopic system in general, right? So uh, how can we get Hamiltonians that generate states that look a little bit like a cat? Uh, one of the ways is to drive actually equally the red and blue sidebands. So if we do that, we get the Hamiltonian showed here, uh, we just sum up the two Hamiltonians we had before, red sideband and blue sideband. And now we have a position operator that I've called X, uh, and it's multiplied with a sigma X uh, operator acting on the spin. So what does that do? It's proportion. This is a Hamiltonian that's proportional to position. I exponentiate that, I get a displacement operator, which is proportional or which uh, has an amplitude proportional to the amount of time actually that I've applied it for but now is proportional to whether I'm in a plus or a minus eigenstate of sigma x. So if I start off in, an, in a superposition of eigenstates of sigma x, that's position, for instance, being in the spin up state, then on applying this Hamiltonian, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the position of the atom either to being at plus x if I'm in the left pointing state or to being at minus x if I'm in the right pointing state. In fact, these are coherent states, so they're oscillating states, but they're fully out of phase with each other, correlated with the state of the spin. So I can write my state, if you like, uh, as uh, atom pointing right or left, correlated with whether I'm in a negative coherent state or a positive coherent state. And that's my analogy to a cat. Why? Because this coherent state can be something that's large. I can make it many, many, I, in principle, I could make it a meter, right? And so the size of coherent state is something that can be uh, reconciled with the classical regime. And that's why we make the analogy then to something uh, macroscopic that's like a cat. Though, of course, this is the motion of a microscopic particle. Yeah. So how does this look? Uh, if we apply such a state dependent force to an oscillator, so we make a transition from the atom being uh, in the spin up state, which is a superposition of left and right, to being correlated with some external degree of freedom. And what that's going to do is that if we applied a small dis or no displacement, we expect if we measure whether we're in spin up, we expect always to find the answer one, that's this state here. Once we've become entangled with another degree of freedom, on measuring spin up, we'll find we've got an equal probability to be uh, either in the up state or in the down state, right? That's what's happening here. And what you see is three different cases here, uh, which I've chosen, and they correspond to different starting states, okay? And the different starting states, so let's first start with the blue one. This is what happens when we just apply that procedure to a ground state. And so what you see here is an indication that there's a drop in coherence and this is an indication of the size of the ground state, the RMS uh, extent, because as these wave packets start to separate from each other and lose overlap with each other, you get this loss of coherence because there's now entanglement between the spin and the motion. Now, if you do that on a squeeze state and you do it on the narrow axis of a squeeze state, then what you see is this curve where the, uh, there's a drop which is much now faster than we had before, right? The overlap is lost much quicker than before. And if you do it on the long axis of a squeeze state, you see the, the overlap takes a longer time to drop, yeah? So this is indicative, or this is the starting point of a notion that here, uh, if we uh, did this sort of drive, we create a cat which is really just coherent states. But if we see this faster drop, i.e. we started with a squeeze state and then applied this state dependent force, as I call it, we should expect that these are now squeezed Schrodinger cat states. These are superpositions of wave packets 
which both of them are now squeezed uh, wave packets. So how big are these cats, right? What's the state of the art today? Uh, the state of the art is that the biggest ones that we've been able to make are around 240 nanometers. And one of the things you can ask, uh, and it's sort of the relationship back to the cat, right? Is how distinguishable is this state from this state here, right? So one way measure of that is how, uh, what's the overlap of a state sitting over here to a state sitting over here. And you see that these overlaps are really tiny, right? They're very distinct. Uh, states in space now, uh, but the, uh, and that's a function of the fact that there's a reasonably large extent of this cat, and that's sort of the boundary, probing the boundary of the macroscopicity, if you like. For the squeezed cats, it's even more extreme, right? You get some sort of factor of 10 to the minus 500. These are clearly extremely distinguishable. Yeah. So how quantum is this, and can we go further than that? Um, well, one of the things to go further than that, one of the frustrations, if you like, of this sort of state is that uh, you measure the spin, right? And when the spin is entangled with the motion, you don't really find out a lot about the motional state that way. You just find out that the spin was entangled with something, right? So how can we find more out about the motion? Well, we can go back to the detection uh, that we had before. So the spin that I'm uh, talking about here is on this uh, S a half to D five halves transition. And if we perform detection, uh, what we do is we scatter a lot of photons if we started off in the S a half state, right? And if we scatter a lot of photons, we'll receive them on our camera and our ion will be bright, yeah? The problem with that from the point of view of the oscillator is that we have to recoil thousands of photons in order to make a good bright detection, okay? So it completely shreds our oscillator state. But we also have the case where we started in the up state here, yeah? And if we started in the up state, we won't scatter any photons. There's no recoil. And we get, if you like, an ideal back action projection of the quantum measurement without having any adverse uh, physical characteristics. So <clears throat> if we perform a measurement, we detect for a certain amount of time and we don't see any photons, we can then after that go and look and do some sort of examination. What's the quantum state of our system? So uh, what we find if we measure in the spin up, spin down uh, case, right, is that we can post select on getting a dark intermediate measurement. And then we can do the right things to create the Wigner function, right? And here's a picture of the Wigner function that we see here. And what you see, it's got a superposition of two Gaussian states at two different positions. That's these blobs here. But in the middle, what you see are these stark interference fringes between the two where the Wigner function is going from plus values to minus values, that's the blue that you see here, right? So this is a very strong indication that this is really a quantum state that couldn't have been uh, produced uh, or has sort of this extra essence of having nodes in the wave function. Uh, and it's really an archetypal uh, quantum state. We call this a Schrodinger cat state. Just to connect that back to what we uh, saw earlier, okay? So when we don't do any post-selection, then what we have is a situation where we would find that our oscillator state, if we were just to look at the oscillator and cross out the spin, is entangled with the spin. And so we actually have a mixture of being in the minus coherent state and in the plus state. And if we look at Rabi oscillations on the blue sideband, uh, then we see this collapse and revival that you saw before, and it's the Poisson distribution in the state distribution, right? These are the different Fox states that we have occupied. After this measurement though, if we post select on seeing up, then we now have an equal superposition of being in alpha and minus alpha, but they've got a definite phase relationship between the two. And what that means is that uh, in the Fox state distribution, all the even Fox states, uh, sorry, I think this must be the, yeah, all the, this should say all the odd Fox states should disappear. Clearly I got this the wrong way around, right? And basically just through the point of view of not scattering photons, you see that all of the alternate populations have been uh, deleted, and now you only have even populations, right? Now the distances between these peaks is twice as far, if you like, so there's a larger frequency separation between the Rabi frequencies, and what you find there is you get an additional revival at about half the time because they come back into phase quicker with each other. We do the other one, if you like, uh, post-select on a different state, uh, we see that the uh, other uh, Fox states go to zero, if you like, and we end up again with this uh, even uh, 
or these only these alternate populations being occupied. So uh, that's, uh, I think I'm going to skip that actually. Uh, I just wanted to say then that um, one of the key things is to be able to see the fringes and the fringes are given by somehow the symmetry of the state. And I should just say that the largest state that we ever made and can actually see some uh, fringes in the middle. And this is a picture of a perfect state, not the state that we actually made, uh, has this distance of 240 nanometers. So this was what it would look like if we made the Wigner function. Uh, I would never be able to persuade my students to do that because uh, it would re require really a lot of data taking to take such a uh, Wigner function. Okay, so I, I very quickly, uh, I'm trying to think what to talk about now. <coughs> Yeah, I'm not going to discuss error correction in any detail because it's a bit complicated. I just wanted to point out that this concept uh, of squeezing and shredding a cat states, if you like, uh, can be applied to more complicated states. So the same procedure of applying a state dependent force and making a projected measurement, if repeated, and in particular repeated on squeeze states, can produce these uh, superpositions of squeeze states that then have this rather interesting periodic structure both in the position direction and in the momentum uh, direction. Yeah. So if we look at the wave functions of these, we'll see these are periodic uh, states. And what was uh, cool for me was that uh, actually these turn out to be an error correction code for quantum computing. Yeah. And we were able to do uh, experiments there. I really don't have time, I think, to go into all of the details of that because I need to tell you about multi-ion uh, uh, states. But just to say uh, that we, Here's some signals. Uh, again, the same trace that you've seen before uh, in terms of when you saw this decay down to 50%, uh, we were then applying it to the ground state or to a squeeze state. Now we're applying it to these periodic states. And you see that in addition to it decaying, and it would decay, you can see a decay something like this, there's some structure due to the periodicity of the initial state in there. And actually these states are exactly made up so that you can make build a qubit this way. So at a particular distance, which reflects the periodicity of the states, uh, you see that if the state is centered at the origin, you get a peak. But if the state has been shifted to the side, and you'll see that that's looking like the same distribution shifted to the side, you get a dip. Yeah, And this is indicative of the fact that actually that's a qubit. Uh, this is the measurement of a qubit. Uh, and uh, what I have is that if this whole distribution is at one point, I get the plus state of the qubit. If the whole distribution is at another state point, it's a minus state. Now, here actually is an operator that's twice as long, uh, but this is what we use to check for errors in this qubit. This is an error correcting code, yeah? And what you see is that regardless of the qubit state, this one is always producing the same value, right? So that's uh, saying that um, the information about errors, we call it a stabilizer operator, is independent or roughly independent of the state of the qubit. So I'm going to flick through this stuff. There's a lot of stuff we did with that, but I don't want to have time to talk about it. Just to say that in the last year, uh, we were able to perform quantum error correction for the same first time in this system. Uh, and what we see of our logical state, if you like, we look at the Pauli observables of our logical state. We see that if we don't do correction, we get fast decay. But if we perform correction, then we can extend the length of a lifetime of our logical qubit. And we extend it by actually a factor of uh, three and a half sort of thing. So I think that's the biggest extension of any logical current uh, qubit that anyone was able to perform to date. Okay, so um, that was a little too quick, but I hope you got an overview for the fact that these uh, cat states can be produced and that multi-component cat states are sort of interesting in their own right for quantum computing. To finish up, I just wanted to talk about what happens when we have more than one uh, ion. So as I explained at the beginning, then uh, when you have more than one ion, they have a Coulomb interaction between them, right? And when there's two, you can think of that as a little spring connecting the two. Uh, but this also extends up to having long chains. So this is a chain of 50 ions. And now, if you like, any if any one of these ions moves, all of the others feel the impact of that uh, motion. So how should we think about that? There's two ways we can think about it. And I think one you dealt with with the Leibfried was to think about static normal modes of the system. Of course, when you have coupled pendula, this kind of first year classical physics, right? That you can resolve this into uh, normal modes, which if you set a normal mode going, it oscillates at a given frequency, right? 
So that's a picture we typically use when we've got quantum gates and when the couplings are strong. But the other thing we can actually have is a situation in which um, the ions, uh, they sit near each other by a distance d. Let's imagine they've got the same frequency. And we can think instead of the normal mode picture about thinking about a dynamical evolution. Imagine that you put energy into just this ion. You'd expect that ion through the coupling to slosh backwards and forwards with some regular period. Yeah? And we would call that the exchange time uh, or exchange frequency. And it's got this dependence and it depends in one over the distance cubed. I just want you to remember that. Yeah. So um, we can consider that as a Hamiltonian that couples these local potentials, right? Uh, and indeed here's the multiplier is this exchange frequency and it uh, creates or and annihilates the quanta in the two different wells. They trade off against each other in an energy preserving way. So how can we view this dynamic picture in terms of the normal modes? I'm sure you're familiar with this with classical physics, but it's basically that we have these two types of motion, one where the ions oscillate in phase with each other, one where they oscillate out of phase with each other. And what you would see is that the difference of frequency of these two is basically given by this exchange frequency. Yeah, so this is what produces the uh, dynamical evolution in this picture is just the separation in frequencies of the normal modes in this picture. So how does that look for many more ions? So here I'm going to plot um, frequencies, if you like, uh, of 10 ions, beryllium ions, where uh, I imagine that my, I've got my trap set up so that radially it's an ion string and perpendicular to that string direction, I've got uh, trap frequencies of 13 and 14 megahertz. And what I'm going to do is show two plots, which are different frequencies along the axis of the trap. So what do you see? Uh, in this case where you've got a low frequency well uh, along the axis, what does that mean? It means two things. It means the curvature is not very high, but it also means that the ions are well separated from each other, right? D is large and the exchange frequency is small. What does that mean? It means there's a, a, a bundle of modes sitting down at the bottom. These are actually all the axial modes of oscillation. But further up, there's this bundle of radial modes. And actually what tells you about the um, uh, separation of these is the um, exchange frequency. Uh, and that was given by one over d cubed, which is the distance between the ions set by the axial trap frequency. And it's got a factor which is proportional to one over the frequency of the <coughs> uh, radial modes, which is this 13 megahertz. So now let's turn up the axial trap frequency. Yeah, we push the ions closer together. And what you see is that, again, the axial modes look like a pretty regularly spaced uh, array, but now the radial modes start to uh, expand, the exchange frequency increased, and they actually all start to merge with each other, even between the two sets of modes in the two different directions. So uh, what's setting the splitting here is this exchange frequency. And depending on the distance between the ions, then you can say to yourself, well, the dynamics from that will be at a high frequency if I produced ions that are close together or at a low frequency compared to maybe my control time scale if the ions are uh, relatively far apart. And so these two complementary pictures are useful. So I just wanted to point out a couple of nice experiments in that regard. This was from uh, the group in Osaka, Kenji Toyoda and colleagues, where they have really uh, two ions in a, each in a radial potential and they consider this hopping term, that's this kappa, is this exchange between the two ions. Now, the oscillations are bosons, right? So what this is, and, and the type of Hamiltonian that I showed you, uh, sorry about that, uh, here is a beam splitter type Hamiltonian, right? So uh, what can they do here? They, they can start the system off with a quanta in each well, and they will interact according to the beam splitter. And what you'll find is that there's bunching. Uh, both ions will, uh, or the quanta will either go to the same uh, ion, right? But they, you don't know which of the uh, same ion they, which of the ions they go to. But you end up in a situation where they never come out of the beam splitter in uh, different ports. And that they were able to uh, demonstrate, right? For phonons, for mechanical motion, right? So here they have uh, phonon coincidence rates looking at this time here, and you'll see that the coincidence goes down to zero uh, at the particular time when the beam splitter should have happened. Yeah. Just one nice example, they're extending this physics to doing 
things which also involve driving with the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And that has a sort of many body name, if you like, a James Cummings Hubble model, uh, which has got some interesting regimes to study for many body physics. The other thing that can be done, and this work was done at NIST uh, in 2011, was to create really uh, two potentials for the two ions and be able to control them independently. Uh, and this is a very nice illustration, if you like. The reason they can do this is by making small uh, iron traps and putting the ions fairly close to the chip. Yeah. So beware the heating, right? And here they saw exactly the correspondence that I was telling you about earlier. Here's the dynamical evolution uh, of a quantum hopping between the two different uh, ions in the two different potential wells. The slope here is given by the heating because their heating is high because the chip is relatively small. So that's something they have to improve. And then in the spectroscopy domain, this is when the two ions are on resonance with each other. You can look at what the frequencies of uh, motion are. And these are the two normal modes, which are now split, you'll see, by a few kilohertz, reflective of the time scale that you see here, uh, rather than maybe the splittings we might use in quantum computing, which would be on their sort of megahertz level. Yeah. And this is saying that this dynamical behavior now is slower than say, uh, control time scales of lasers, which allows you to be in a different regime of looking at hopping uh, of bosons between different sites. So just to say that that's got a longer term future that's of interest, and I'll come back to in the next lecture, if you like. Um, so one can imagine trying to make uh, electrode structures so one can make 2D arrays of ions. Uh, and in this case, this is a hexagonal lattice, which is really defined by the structure of the underlying electrodes. So again, uh, I remind you that the hopping time scale is the distance between ions, and the height is somehow the thing that's challenging with respect to noise, because that governs the heating that we see. And people have really mapped this out to see uh, whether this is uh, really uh, feasible. Uh, and I plot a graph here, not for you to read, and I won't go through it in any detail. So the theoretical studies have been uh, performed and people are working in this direction. There's sort of new results coming from, I think, NIST at the moment on this. Um, but again, going back to the big problem, if you like, the heating problem will be somehow critical to making this work in a larger scale. But that's the path, if you like, of motional states towards many body control and examining uh, many body physics. So with that, then I'd like to thank you for your attention. I thank my group who backed me up and provided nice experimental results that hopefully some of them I could show you. Uh, and um, Look forward to further questions then. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. I think there is already one question that's on the yeah. on the chat. Um, could you produce cat states with two ions? Yeah, so I mean, in a certain sense, then you'll see that in the quantum logic gates that we do um, on two, two ions to entangle two spins, that in a sense, what's happening there is there's, uh, at that time, there's usually some set of spin configuration which is correlated with being in the ground state still, uh, some which is uh, correlated with being in a plus coherent state, some correlated with being in a minus coherent state. So in a sense, that's a cat state, but it's not this two component cat that we uh, talked about. Yeah? Uh, and there may be more flexibility there with projecting out um, motional states. So I would say maybe the thing to do there would not be to look so much at cat states, but to be to look at more complex states that you could create if you had the additional flexibility of having two spins. Yeah, so that would somehow, it would be more like looking at these GKP, these multi-component squeeze states that I would find attractive about uh, a two ion realization. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any other questions that might, I mean, please write it down on the chat box. I don't see any at the moment. So, okay, if that is not the case, maybe we, we close the session now. Um, thanks for your, I mean, this is a wonderful talk. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.